Hey, welcome everyone. Seems like people are trickling in. Hey everybody. Hey, thanks for joining. We're gonna give everyone a few minutes to, to get in here. So uh, if in the meantime, uh, people wanna use the chat to introduce themselves, that's always uh, helpful for us to kind of get a sense of where people are calling from and in their roles. Uh, if you wanna have some fun with it, you can um, you know, write in what you think CX is, but wrong answers only if you wanna uh, get creative. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, definitely feel free to use the chat, introduce yourself. We'll hang out for a few minutes while we let people uh, get in here and then we'll, uh, we'll kick it off. And um, if, if you've used Zoom before, you might know this, but if not, um, in webinars, there's a Q&A function. So if you do have questions, please put them in there because uh, then you can upvote other questions that are similar or ones that you also would like to answer. And it makes it a lot easier for us to, to organize and, and respond to them. Uh, they get kind of lost in the chat. So if you could please use the uh, chat function, that would be super appreciated. Sorry, the Q&A function, um, but use chat to introduce <laughs> yourself. Welcome from North London. Cool. Hey, Stuart. Welcome. All right, we got a, got a nice group trickling in here, so we'll just give it another minute or so. Um, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for joining for our, our third live podcast, I think. Sounds right. Um, ah, welcome from Kentucky, close nice. to my native Ohio. Nevada, yeah, excellent. Representation from everywhere. Kenya. Nice. Cool. Well, yeah, global nice. very group. international crowd. Awesome. <clears throat> All right, well, I think we can go ahead and get started and more folks can trickle in. Uh, for anyone joining now, just make sure if you have any questions, please uh, ask them in the Q&A. You should see that at the bottom of your screen and check out other questions other folks have asked. You can upvote them and we'll, we'll try to focus on the ones that have the most interest. <clears throat> All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Awkward Silences. Today, we're here with our guest, Kim Salazar. She's a senior UX specialist at Nielsen Norman Group. Thanks for joining us, Kim. Thank you for having me. Got JH here, too. Yeah, I, I always like transformation topics. They seem so like lofty and <laughs> tense, so this should be cool. Yeah, today we're talking about CX transformation, a hot topic. Uh, and what, what does CX transformation mean? I don't know. We're going to find out. It's really good stuff. And how does UX research fit into that CX transformation? So we've got the expert on the topic here to uh, answer all our questions. Thanks so much for joining us, Kim. Yeah. So let's start from the top. CX transformation, you know, as I said, it is this kind of buzzy thing we're hearing about. Uh, what does it mean? Yeah. So you're right. It's kind of a buzzword. It's a really lofty word kind of uh, loaded, but essentially what it means is um, a company makes a conscious decision to put customers at the center of all their decision-making and at the center of what they do. Um, and that requires change, of course, because a lot of times right now, companies think they're user-centered or they wanna be user-centered, but they're really relegating that responsibility down into their product group and into their UX people. But we all know that, you know, customer journeys are touching on all parts of the business, not just on the digital products. People are calling into support lines. People are, you know, receiving print to mail stuff from your company. And so there's this journey that's going on. And I know everyone's probably familiar with this concept of customer journeys. But one of the big issues we see is that the journeys are fragmented and they're not connected. They're not consistent. And people are really having to do a lot of effort to move from one of one you know, interaction to the next. So that's the whole purpose behind CX transformation is deliberately making the decision to connect all those touch points, which requires operational change. It requires you know, a mindset change, a culture change, um, and even changes in, the, in your technical infrastructure to really be able to support the the 
things that we need to do to design connected journeys. So yeah, it's just, you know, making change to be deliberate and proactive about designing well organized high quality journeys rather than reactive and, you know, uh, fixing things and fixing pain points later on. And where does like a CX transformation project even come from? Like, so it's a great goal, right? That a company wants to become more centric around what their users are doing and all the different touch points they have. Is that something that like has to come from the top where somebody decides, hey, we really need to do this because it's such a big undertaking or can it be yeah. kind of more organic or, or how does that actually even come to be? Great question because it, um, you're right. When we talk about something that includes so much operational change, it feels out of our reach for a lot of us. The, the ideal you know, solution is that yes, it's coming from C-level executive leadership because to really try to do the, the root problem changes that are necessary in, in, in restructuring and re-operationalizing the way we work around users has to come from the top. Um, but with that being said, I know we're not all in a position to be able to influence that kind of change. So um, I talk about, I teach a course on this topic and I talk about how, try to find a scope that is achievable. You know, maybe you're in a, a um, product group within your organization, if you're in a large organization or you're in a specific department or line of business, those smaller scopes can be a starting point where you can apply some of these transformation um, guidelines and best practices and, and changes where you're not trying to influence a huge thing, but something more achievable. And, and that can be a starting place. Yeah, so transformation, like big word in any context. And as we talked about, there are all these different sort of components to how you kind of transform from point A to point B. Point B, being this world where customers truly are the center of your of your organization and how mm -hmm. you interact with, with your customers. What are some of the things that have to be true to get to that transformational change? Yeah, so I think that the big underlying root issues that cause the fragmentation that we're trying to resolve is the fact that we're working in silos and, and meaning that we have different teams and groups that have very focused roles and responsibilities. And we, over the years, haven't been really good at uh, collaborating or having a shared strategy and a shared vision. So connecting people is one of the main things that we have to do. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean literally like reorganizing your, your company for this purpose, but it does mean making some deliberate decisions to create um, programs to connect people, maybe uh, building some formal networks that transcend the traditional hierarchy where, you know, people from different areas and, and cross functions are, are connecting and, and sharing uh, work priorities and sharing ideas and strategies. So that's one thing. And the second one is connecting your technology. Because the same thing is true about our backend infrastructures. You know, as we've grown and companies have matured over the years, we've all got disparate data systems. So, you know, what sales and marketing is using is going to be different from what customer support is using, which creates some constraints for us. Because if we want to connect and have a, a, a comprehensive sort of personalized journey for our customers, we have to connect all that data in a way that it allows us to understand our users at a more one-on-one -on -one level. So connecting our data so then we can start to do some of the things that will improve the experience for them. I'd imagine, I'm guessing, right? Cause I've never been through a CX transformation process in a large organization, but it feels like something when it's first introduced, everybody would be pretty receptive to it, right? It, it just sounds good. Like let's be more user and customer centric. Yeah. I'd imagine though that some of the teams that maybe are a little siloed are set up that way because they're more autonomous and they can just go do things, right? And uh, they probably employee-wise like some of that in terms of we can just go change this and see what happens. When you now need to be a little bit more coordinated of, well, this change in this area might actually affect this other team over here and we wanna keep the user in the middle of that. Does, 
do you ever hit like resistance where people start to feel like this is now slowing them down or they're not able to make the impact that they want? Like, how do you, how do people wrestle with that aspect of it? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think with any kind of change, even transformational change like this, you're going, you're going to get uh, people that may push back against change. Change is hard <laughs> and it's scary because you don't know, you know, what you're going to get out of it on the other side. So that's why I think to really be able to do this right, we have to have somebody at that top level of leadership that is sponsoring this and, and making it a mandate. And it has to be more planned in nature um, with supporting programs and, and things in place to help people uh, understand where, they're, where they fit into that future state. So it can't just be saying like, okay, now we all need to work together and um, we're going to do a CX transformation. It has to include things like uh, we're having training. We're going to do, you know, one-on-one -on -one sessions to, for each team to understand, you know, what their behavior changes are going to have to be. And what does that mean for the way that they're rewarded or, you know, incentivized. And it's, it's more of a strategic uh, delivery of, of this new way of working. It can't just be, you know, somebody saying, oh, we got to all change now. So we got to consider what the impact is going to be on some of those high priority groups. Like I know, for example, I've uh, talked to somebody who went through a CX transformation at a software company and their salespeople were really, you know, uh, scared about this because they had this autonomy to make deals and get their mm -hmm. get their incentives from those sales and and they were worried about that so it had to be a plan in place ahead of time to make sure that they weren't going to be negatively affected by this this change going forward so i mean putting plans in place planning it out way in advance it has to be a communication strategy and methodology that includes like tactical things and change management is at the core of it. Yeah, and I, I think you hit on just the importance of aligning incentives and understanding incentives, because at the end of the day, we all have different reasons to be motivated to do whatever we're doing at work, and uh, that we're going to do better work and be motivated to get on board with this transformation if we can see how um, it, it aligns with why we come to work every day. And mm -hmm. I think that gets to a related question. We've talked a little bit about you know, what is CX transformation? What are some of the necessary sort of ingredients to make that happen? But why is it so important? I mean, it sounds obvious, right? Obviously everyone on, on this call, I'm sure wants to um, be user centric, be customer centric, but why is this transformation so important? Why is it so important right now? Um, yeah, so this is one of the reasons why this topic, this buzzword is starting to bubble up a lot in the last year or so is because companies know based on reporting and data over the last five or six years that companies that have a user-centered strategy and are, are working in a user-centered way are seeing more business level or business benefits on the, on the other, on the other side. So there's gobs of data from various groups like Forrester and McKinsey that, sh that have looked across um, industries and looked at uh, how well these companies in different sectors are performing in terms of satisfaction and loyalty with their customers. And then they correlate that to their business outcomes. So what they've found is that the companies that are investing in uh, CX and, and transforming and getting their technology situated to be able to deliver good customer journeys are also the ones that are seeing like much higher revenue, better stock performances, um, better loyalty and less churn. So there's this huge business value to come out of it. And we're in a position now where uh, consumers are so ingrained in our experiences. They're so transparent now. You're, you, you're moving from you know your phone to your desktop to text to email to the phone so seamlessly now that th it's so apparent when there's pain points where it used to not be the case. So it's starting to become a priority because people can leave and go to a competitor and, 
and they're doing so on the basis of experience nowadays, where it used to be about, you know, the product and, uh, you know, price, but everybody's matching on that. And now we're trying to compete on experience. So that's why this is becoming such a hot topic and a, an important discussion at organizations is because what we're, what we've done up to this point, we've sort of hit a threshold. And now we have to really think about positioning our, our organization to work better so that we can deliver for our customers. And how does user research fit into all this, right? So I imagine to be more, to go through a CX transformation, you need to be more user centric, which means mm -hmm. you need to understand the users. Is that something now where each team becomes responsible for that? Or is there somebody centrally coordinating, you know, the holistic journey and trying to provide insights for the whole, whole organization or like, how do people approach it? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of ways that you could approach it. it. It's very dependent on the way your organization is structured already, how mature your design group might be. Uh, a lot of companies might even already have technically what is called a CX team. Traditionally, those CX teams are more focused on like market marketing and, and customer support. Um, in the future, I think that's going to transition to where it's a little more holistic in nature that they're, they're really thinking about the customer journey from a user-centered design perspective, like, like we might as UX practitioners. Um, what was your question, John? Just like, uh, the, the, uh, just like how user research fits in. Cause it's, it, yes. it just seems so broad. Like you need to understand this like holistic experience. Whereas, you know, one team focuses on this part and stuff. So like who coordinates that or how does that research even happen? Right. Yeah. So the typical way and the way that we teach to teach people to start getting started with this is to get what we call a, a core uh, CX team in place. And that CX team is going to sort of take the lead on, on trying to build this transformation and manage that change over time. And one of the first things that that team does is try to uh, put in place what we call a research program. And it's essentially, it's, um, I think of it as like a machine that's fueling all of the work that we do. And it should be focused on your key customer journeys. So the goal is really to um, define all of the different things that you want to measure throughout the customer journey, all the different touch points and channels where you want to be listening and, and trying to gather qualitative insights, and then um, building a plan for how you're going to analyze that and, and pull those insights and report on them. Uh, so it includes qualitative research, uh, measuring metrics and, and counting interactions, and then analyzing that so we can start to see like, okay, you know, when people you know, have trouble at this key touch point early in the journey, that seems to indicate you know, that they're more likely to churn or they're less likely to resubscribe. So when you try to build this really intimate understanding of your journeys so you can start prioritizing work for the whole company on that. Um, but that doesn't replace uh, more of the traditional user research that I think you were uh, touching on. Mm -hmm. When, when the work is in place and we're, and we're uh, making changes, you say at like a product level or at the interface design level, you still need to go and do user research as you normally would to inform those um, design changes. It's just like a higher scope of user research and it comes in a, it's built in a proactive way. So it's really fueling the company's strategy. Um, and you're always able to look at the data that's coming in for your journeys and, and know, you know, how the quality is changing and, and moving over time. When you talk about this CX team, is this, um, and I imagine it could be different in different organizations, but more of a sort of like temporary task force, like we are going to lead the charge in this transformation, or is that more of a permanent kind of cross-functional team or could be both or... Yeah, actually, it kind of changes. It, it, it organically matures over time. It starts out as a task force, like you say, um, putting all the basic capabilities in place that is going to allow us to start working differently. So that's like, of course, is the, the research program that I already mentioned. Other things would be um, 
processes and plans and standards for how we need to collaborate and work going forward, governance on that type of thing, um, culture change initiatives, uh, what else? Um, so all of the, the foundational things. And then as the program starts to pick up steam, the, the core team, that CX team, sort of changes into more of a CX strategy group. So they're not pushing the change as much anymore, but they're now managing um, the quality of the journeys and, and managing the priorities of work that is going on across all the functions and then helping to coordinate all that work across functions too. Got it. So I imagine there's just a ton to kind of figure out as that task force um, it started, you know, we're talking about how user research is so important to this work and how important it is for research to uh, proactively inform an opinionated vision of what that customer journey ought to look like, right? Rather than mm -hmm. just react to it. Mm -hmm. And how might teams get to that place of having that opinionated vision of what the journey should look like using research, right? Because it, you know, is it a, a CEO that just has a vision for this is what we want our journey to look like. And we know our yeah. customers are going to be ha happy if that's true or looking at the data you have available to you already based on where people have problems or do you blow up the existing journey and like truly transform or iterate on what you currently have? Like, how do you know where yeah. you're trying to get and how do you use research to figure that out? So that's a big question. Um, and it, it touches on some topics that, you know, is common in, in this space. So the research that in the, the proactive research that you're conducting to try to create this vision is gonna help. So you wanna build that foundation, get, get all the data that's gonna help you inform what to do with it. But there's a couple of strategies that you can take. Um, so, I think I have an article that I've written about this. It's called the refine, rebuild, remodel, <laughs> because it's like thinking about your journey as something that you can either sort of refine, try to keep all of the rough edges off, address pain points proactively, and just make it as nice as possible. You can be a little more innovative with it, where you maybe try to rebuild and, and reimagine certain pieces of it while keeping the general uh, customer journey in place or remodel, which is throwing it out and, and re-delivering. It's going to be dependent on a lot of factors. And this is why having executive partnership is so important is because, you know, what is our appetite for this type of risk? Because the remodel is really risky. And is that something that we can afford to take on right now? Um, usually you want to start out with trying to start on refining what your existing um, journeys look like and just making them better. As you continue to gather data over time and understand your market and understand your users, then you may feel comfortable to say, okay, this journey, it's great as it is, but there are uh, customer needs that we're not addressing that might take more innovation. And you might make some strategic, strategic decisions to do a little more like service design thinking about it and redesigning the, the delivery of the entire service and journey itself. You, you mentioned a few times now about like, you know, is this journey, I don't, this is not, you've said it more elegantly, like, is this journey good, right? Basically, like how do, and, um, but the first question comes to me is like, how do you actually know if that's the case? Like, are there standard, um, this is actually one of the questions in the Q&A, like, are there standard or typical CX transformation metrics that people keep an eye on? And like, we can tell we've improved this journey for, for our users because we've seen these metrics move in, in certain directions. Yes, so there are you know the, the standard uh, perception metrics that people often think about when we talk about customer experience would be, one of them would be net promoter score, NPS, which is the one that uh, you get by asking people how likely they are to recommend you to a friend. That's a common one. There's also customer satisfaction um, customer effort score is one of these. And there are ways in which we can try to ask um, our customers to rate us. And, and that helps us to understand how, what the quality is from their per point of view. But those metrics, unfortunately, aren't as 
dependable as we would like them to be, it's different than being able to say, you know, our revenue point at one revenue metric and, and know that that's mm-hmm. the truth. With these perception metrics, they're a lot more um, tricky because they can be misleading a lot of times. So the the takeaway with with measuring your the quality of your experience is you can't rely on one thing. You really have to put together a whole set of different things that you're watching. I've called this like make a quilt of data or make a casserole full of data. And you're really trying to figure out what are all these indicators that could help me understand the quality. So you want to do your perception metrics as one ingredient into that. Um, Your, you know, of course, your business metrics, like the things that you're tracking of how sales and, and loyalty and stuff like that, but also smaller things like how many, um, how many clicks did this feature get or, and then by putting all that stuff and combining it all together, you can start watching and, um, and you might see, you might see some trends or, or correlations coming through. Like you might see, okay, in our, in our qualitative feedback, we're seeing a lot of discussion about the, for example, the bill pay when someone's paying their bill and that seems problematic. And we're starting to see um, a lot of customer support calls about bill pay. And we also have a really low NPS score after we ask them about bill pay. So you start to triangulate all these things and hone in on where maybe there's some, the, some friction. And if you make a change, then you watch and see what happens to those various metrics. The, the perception metrics, the ones that we're asking our customers to rate us by, those are less directly correlated to the work we do. So we can change the bill pay experience and probably see some changes in those things that we're counting that we think indicate Mm -hmm. poor experience. But the NPS and CSAT, those are slower to react. So usually you have to wait a little more time, but that's okay because the goal I don't think should be to have a specific NPS score because that again is not indicative really of the quality that what's indicative of the quality is that you're seeing less questions about things. You're seeing less um, comments from people about the pain they're experiencing. And hopefully then you're also seeing more revenue and and fewer operational costs. And that's what we should be trying to, to achieve. So unfortunately, I, there's just not one clean metric. It's really trying to have this really intimate understanding of all of the, your different indicators and starting to look for um, relationships between them. You know, okay, I noticed that when people miss a payment, they also, you know, tend not to resubscribe. So maybe that's, there's some relationship there. And and we can help people early in the process so that they're not missing a payment and give them some more tools to help them, you know, remember to make their payments. Okay. You talked a little bit about building this research program, you know, being an important aspect of the CX task force, which becomes a, a CX team. What is what sorts of research is that team, you know, doing on an ongoing basis? Does it look like user research? Does it look like customer research, are they the same thing by a different name? What are, what are we talking about? So I think it, there's a couple of different types of research that they're gonna be doing. There, some of it I think is gonna be like ethnographic in the field research to really understand your users the same way that we do um, with our interface level UX work. Um, diary studies, things that are more longitudinal in nature, of course. So there's going to be that, but then there's also more, uh, more of a emphasis on the collection of behavioral data in the journey. So maybe looking at your journey map and saying, what things can we collect? What behaviors should we count and measure to build this casserole of data? And you're going to have to have a somebody with a skill set in data science to start to draw those trends and correlations out of that 
you know, that big data. So there's the, the measurement piece, which is going to be really big. Um, and also you're doing, you're probably going to try to look for some trends in your qualitative feedback. So some people might have heard of the term voice of customer program. That's a, that's a traditional program that um, CX teams of old would put in place to listen to things that people were saying on across all different channels. So that's still a part of how you inform, you know, research for, you know, CX of the future. So you're going to want to pull that in there too and, and start doing um, sentiment analysis on that and text analytics on that. So it's a little bit of the same ethnography that we might be doing, but a lot focused on metrics and measurement. Great. So true sort of qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods. Exactly. Um, active, -prong passive. Approach. Yeah. Yeah. Picturing like a big cork board with like string all over it <laughs> and people just trying to connect the dots. I would say that um, the passive collection of the data and stuff tends to be the first part of the mm -hmm. flow. And then you, you look at that and look for things that you want to uh, investigate further. And then you're probably going out in the field and trying to pinpoint and focus in on understanding truly what you know, the issues are that are happening at those points in time that you have the clues from the, the passive data coming in. I imagine the segmentation is really important here too, right? Because um, especially if we're talking about a large enterprise truly trying to undergo, you know, transformation across, mm -hmm. you know, many business units and departments and so on, um, you have more than one customer profile. You have yeah. many more than one journey. And to your point, you don't have to tackle them all at once, right? But no. even so, um, getting to that right level of granularity, which is, I'm sure is a whole other episode itself, but finding that right level of granularity, this is a meaningful journey. This is a meaningful segment, a meaningful job to be done, whatever it is that we're exactly. gonna grow in on and, and focusing your data collection and analysis there. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the transformation and the, the CX transformation and, and getting the operational stuff in place is one thing that's, mm -hmm. that's done in order to allow yourself to operate differently. And then right. once you have that in place, you can say, okay, where's the business opportunity? You know, what's our most high touch customer journey? What, which customer journey is, uh, brings us the most business value. You, there's a lot of different components that could go into making that decision. And then of course, then narrowing it down even further, which seg sector, which segment are we gonna focus on for strategic reasons? And definitely start small and, and build from there, but zero in on that journey and, and those key segments. Uh, and then you can start to build that, that research program specifically for those. And then once that's in place, you can kind of start to spin up other instances of that for future, uh, you know, increase in your scope of focus. There's, there's a related question from Brett in the Q&A about, you know, like what is a realistic time frame for a large organization to make this type of culture change? Um, and maybe it may be an interesting way to frame it because I'd imagine it's, it's contextual, not yeah. the answer for you, but um, a question like, what's like the, the short end? Like, it, can you make progress in this in a few months or is it like just the data gathering and everything else takes so long that it's, it's a long journey? It's going to be a long journey, um, no matter where you are. Here's the thing. Smaller companies have smaller, have fewer barriers. So if you're at a company of like 5,000 people or less, um, 3,000 people or less, there's going to be less uh, people to connect and less technology dependencies to deal with. So probably if you have a very proactive and well bought in stakeholder group, you could maybe start seeing change within a year. If it's more of a let's test the waters and, and be a little more conservative, it's gonna be probably more like two or three years. The larger the organization gets, the longer this gets because there's more risk involved. Um, so there might be an entire you know, period leading up to even deciding to institute this type of initiative of doing research and trying to figure out what the investment is going to look like, what the trade-off is going to be. Because a lot of times if you're refocusing the way you prioritize work, 
you, you're probably going to see a period where you're not getting the immediate um, return on like you did when you were totally focused on, on just marketing, for example. So the bigger the company, the more time they're going to have to take to plan out and decide if this is even a thing. And then de again, depending on how proactive they are with it, it could be two to five years before I think it's mature enough where it's, we're changed now. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a long game. <laughs> and that's okay. The customer journey of customer journeys. It's a whole. Yeah. <laughs> um, got a, a well liked question here about um, so talking with the CEO and they say users don't really know what they want. When you're trying to introduce CX UX processes, how do you address this? The classic faster horse, right? He's asking for a friend, by the way. Want to be clear? Yes, for sure. <laughs> Always. <laughs> yeah. So. I guess I think I understand what the question is, is like, how do you start to build buy-in with, with stakeholders on the value of, of research? Yeah. And that, yeah, like, you know, um, we could ask our users what they want their journey to look like, but they don't know. Right. Like right. We just do what they tell us, are we going to make more money? You know? Right. Um, yeah. I think that that sentiment is, is true. I don't think any researcher ha in, has ever, you know, planted their sword on, on just asking users what they want. We always have to do the ethnography and observations and, and understanding how to solve problems that we, we see them creating uh, in a way that makes sense for a company, not just what they say. Um, and that still applies at this large scope of experience design too. Um, so, a lot of dealing with stakeholders and, and getting them on board is going to is going to be about showing them what the business value is and and kind of along the same lines. It might be a little bit of a side note. Uh, one thing that I will say when it comes to working with these leadership roles and, and starting having this discussion, um, I would say don't go back and say we need a CX transformation. <laughs> that that is always you know met with dead on arrival i think the best focus for people who want to try to influence this type of large change is to focus on helping leadership understand the business value that could be had by being more proactive about the quality of the journeys we're building you know organically rather than being reactive about fixing things later that's really mm -hmm. sort of the focus on, on in your communication, but that's also a long game too. It's going to be showing proof, bringing, uh, you know, showing value at a small scale and, and not just saying, you know, oh, we need to go and do a transformation. It yeah, feels like a case. Some... Yeah. It feels like a case too, where like a really good story around a horrible journey somebody experienced probably goes a long way, right? Mm -hmm. Of Hey, this is somebody who tried to reset their password because of a security alert. They got the you know two-factor text thing, and they never got the text message. So then the site prompted them to call into user support. They called the number that we told them to call. We didn't recognize their phone number. They got put on hold, mm -hmm. right? And like, and you can tell like probably a real story where like this person spent two hours trying to get their account back because they forgot their password. Um, and it's all because some of these systems didn't talk to each other or whatever. And like, that feels maybe more powerful than like, can we, hey, can we do like a CX transformation? Right. You know I, mean? like, I think, yes, that's a valuable component of trying to uh, educate and build buy-in on this, on the need for, for changing the way we work. Unfortunately, in my experience, and for a lot of the people that I interviewed for my research about this was they really didn't get much traction by focusing on users, you know, poor experiences, what tends to be more helpful, and I think in conjunction with the empathetic evidence, is showing how that poor experience resulted in loss of revenue, potential purchases, right, right. Yeah, so taking or loss further. of customers. Yeah, so for example, one lady that I interviewed worked for a a uh, credit union who they sold, you know, they had home loans and they did this customer 
research to build a journey map and found that the biggest issue was that these people, these home buyers, they're really excited, right? And to buy a home and they apply for this loan and it could take anywhere from 12 to 20 days before they heard anything from the company. And when they did, it was just like a very poorly communicated notification. And, and she kept pushing about how poor this experience mm. was and, and, and they just weren't moved by it um, because they're focusing on the KPIs and metrics that they're responsible for. So what, and what she ended up doing was saying, okay, our market research shows us that people like to consolidate their uh, financial products with a single servicer. Mm -hmm. And all these people that are getting home loans are not purchasing additional products from us because the experience is so mm. bad. So if we can make that first experience really good with them, you know, help them see the, help be transparent about where their loan is in process. Let them know when to expect something. Be a little more, you know, positive and exciting with the communications we send them when they're approved. Then we're going to be able to bundle products. And that's what it was that moved these stakeholders was, oh, okay, I see if we want to sell them more products and sort of push these bundles to these people, we have to make sure that we do better than what we've been doing with the first product that they're buying from us. Yeah, that's and that's, point. and that's what it took. And they started then had projects and priorities around improving that experience for, for from that, from that conversation. A uh, good question here from Zoe. Uh, how does this work in B2B companies where users don't necessarily equal customers? In other words, you have your buyers of the product and then you have your end users and sometimes they're the same, often they aren't. Yeah, good question. Um, I think you, you in that situation, you've got two different types of journeys that you need to be thinking about. The some of it is going to be the the experience that your buyers have as they're aware and researching and, and sort of working with your company to potentially purchase you know a contract or whatever it may be with you so that's going to be one experience that you're focused on and the next one is going to be connecting and building good journeys for the actual end users of whatever product or service it is so although you've got a couple of different journeys and, and ways to, to focus your design, the transformation itself is going to be beneficial for both of those purposes. Um, put, getting your operational structure in place that's going to allow you to um, conduct research proactively, collaborate differently, is can influence the you know, the quality of how you design for your buyers and how you design for the end users. If uh, you could potentially even start and, and prioritize one area, because it just depends how your organization is structured. And, you know, if, if you've got teams that really focus on the buyer aspect of things, you might be able to kind of use that as your beta project and show value there and then say, okay, let's, let's recreate what we did here for our end customer experience and sort of, you know, connect those two departments by applying the same transformation methodologies. Cool, let's, uh, let's do a two-parter here. Um, what is the major difference between UX and CX? And then is UX a part of CX? Yeah, good questions. And we're not lacking any terminology in this field, right? <laughs> so. The way that I see the difference between UX and CX is a matter of scope. Um, back in the day when UX was coined, the term was coined, it was really broad in nature where it was really referencing no matter what type of experience it was, the user experience is supposed to be good. Over time, as UX started being adopted by a lot of companies and applied in practice, it came to have a really a more limited definition where people usually talk about it specific to product teams, interaction level designs. So like single interactions, maybe it's just, you know, when I log on to a website to do a thing, um, 
and more like interface level stuff. So that's when people talk about UX, that's typically the scope, but uh, we have larger scopes of experience. We have customer journeys, which is made up of many related interactions as people try to achieve a larger goal. So if it's purchasing health insurance, I'm gonna do my research on various devices first. Maybe I'm calling a company, maybe I'm you know, receiving ads and mailers and, and things in the mail and before I actually decide to purchase. And so that's a journey and that scope of experience is larger and it takes different things to make it good. And then there's even larger experience. There's just like the relationship level of experience. So, you know, the experience I have being a customer of my uh, mobile phone service provider over the course of 10 years. Um, so those broader scopes of experience is what people typically refer to as CX. However, they're all based on the same notion of user-centered design. Um, so in the future, I think UX and CX are gonna start to merge into a more unified practice at companies. Nowadays, UX and CX are, are separate, but that's part of what kind of goes into this, this ch change in mindset of CX transformation is, th is trying to unify and saying, we, we can't just have our CX and product or our UX and product people doing one thing and then have everybody else doing other things because that's what's resulting in these poor customer journeys and fragmentation. So in the future, I think that UX is going to be sort of um, an under a CX umbrella, uh, no matter what you call it, the label you know, isn't exactly important, but they should all be working toward a single unified strategy of the customer experience, different scopes. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how that changes organizational mm -hmm. structures in the future. You're mm -hmm. starting to see, like we're starting to see more centralization of insights teams, right? Where you bring research and data science together. Yeah, um, um, so that, that sounds similar sort to of, kind of what I was saying with the, yeah, with the CX exactly. programs focuses. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, we got one here from Karen. If you don't have journeys in place yet, should you focus on getting those in place and then jump into this type of work? So it's sort of an order of operations question we talked about a little bit before, but you start with the journey you have, um, yeah. right? Um, get those in place first. Important to understand what you have first. Is that an important first step or where do you recommend jumping in? Um, I think it's gonna be situational. I will say if, when, when you say if we don't have journeys in place, I, I'm thinking you probably just don't have the research and journey map in place around your journeys. You've got journeys, people are, are interacting <laughs> with you already. Right. Um, so I would say you, if you haven't done journey mapping for your key journeys already, that's usually an indicator that you're more on the early or less mature end of um, readiness for this type of change. So I would say, yes, start with doing your journey level research and, and looking at what you're currently doing with your experience. If you know, you're in a position where you're already journey mapping and you're already doing this work to, to fix your journeys, but you're realizing this is reactive and, and we don't have, we're, we're not built to collaborate and, and, fix the underlying organizational issues that we need to fix to, to fix the journey for the user, that's what usually starts to happen. You, you'll do the research and you're like, wait, but the big problem is that our databases aren't connected. And I, as a UX designer, have no power to fix that. And th this is a larger change than just this journey that, or a larger issue than just this journey. This is an issue with all of our journeys because none of our databases are connected. Um, if you're starting to have those conversations, then it's probably an indicator that now it's time to uh, start thinking about transformation. And at that point, you probably have already touched on your journeys already. So you should know, you know, which ones are important and, and where you want to focus. Uh, Marianne has a question about who's involved in the transformation. Is it something where you need external consultants or influencers, or can you have an internal you know, C-level type champion. Um, how do you see teams typically approach it? Yeah, so 
both I've seen both approaches. Um, if your organization and your C level stakeholders are are um, what's the if they're prioritizing this and they're excited about it and they're um, pushing this mandate on their own, I don't think you need a consultant. I think the you know a consultant could be helpful to really help. Um, with their expertise on, on knowing which changes to make and help the, help the executives figure out uh, some of the first steps and building this, this transformation. Um, but I think the most important step is just knowing that you do need to change. Um, however, if the executives are a little less certain and they're still trying to decide if this is the route that they should go. Cause this is typically what happens is they know um, executives know it's important and they know they should be doing it but they really don't know where to start. That's where I think a consultant can be valuable because the consultant can come in and, and just provide that direction. Um, but if they've got their, if they seem a little more motivated on their own the information is out there, you could, you know put a CX team in place and, and pull some people in who do have the insight, as long as it has executive backing, I think that it could be successful that way too. Yeah, that's related to Samuel's question here, which is just, you know, you've made the decision, we're gonna do this, we're on board, what's the first step? And so to your point, like you have, you have people who are kind of like on the, uh, I don't know, I wanna do it, I don't know how I'm scared. Mm -hmm. That's where a consultant can be useful. Maybe we've gotten just past that hump. Okay, fine, yes, yes, we're gonna do it. This is the year, 2021. Yeah. Um, now what do you do? So the answer to this is kind of a little bit anticlimactic because really <laughs> what you should do, it sounds really trite, but you need to get it down on paper write a vision statement and it really just is a short statement that that shows your commitment and your alignment so saying like you know what in a short way i can't think of one off my head but what your your purpose is for the customers you know um i don't even know if i have any at my fingertips right now but the kind of the kind of experience you want to bring to your customers and, and prioritize customer experience and, and say that in a way that, that fits with your brand and your you know general brand vision and start to build um, responsibilities. So assigning roles to some of these key responsibilities and formalizing that because what you want to do is start to build uh, commitment and, and, um, accountability. And that comes with just like really trying to formalize your, your vision and your strategy and your plan so that people can't turn and, and make a decision that is in conflict with that aligned vision strategy and plan. Right. We have a final question here from Paul, uh, around some metrics again, you mentioned CSAT and MPS. Would you put, um, I actually don't know this metric, SUS, S-U-S, in that bucket? Um, is that any more or less valid in, uh, in these types of measurements? Um, I'm not super uh, well-versed with SUS either. I don't know if that's a perception metric. I think it's more of like a, a framework for evaluation if I'm It's correct. a system usability scale. I just Googled it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think you can, I think you I land like on it. <laughs> I think you land on it through um, evaluation of various things. I don't, I mean, short answer, even though I don't know, you know, I'm not super well-versed in that specific metric. I don't think that including it would be detrimental at all. Cause really what I, the whole point of, of uh, metrics when it comes to your, quality of your customer journey is the more and the more multi-pronged you have, the better, because it, it gives you this sort of living organism and you're constantly watching to see, okay, I see a pain point here, or I see strength here. And if you get really close and intimate with all that data, you'll start noticing 
those things. And when you pull this lever, like you make this change in the customer journey, then you see changes. And it's then that reinforces your understanding of, of all how those metrics relate in React. So if there's a, you know, a metric like SUS that you're already using for, you know, I don't know if it's a touch point specific metric or if it's more of a journey level metric, I think that that certainly would be valuable addition to your data casserole. casserole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I, I'm just picturing somebody walking around being like, this journey sus. Like we got a sus journey here. That we <laughs> Great. Well, we answered all the questions. Any parting thoughts for everybody before we say goodbye? Last, parting words of wisdom on CX, UX, and most importantly, sus. I think what I like to leave people with is just don't get overwhelmed. I know this topic seems so large and, and unapproachable, but the really at the core of it, it's, it's about trying to connect the way we work in a more connected way and use journey level data to fuel how we work rather than qualitatively evaluating journeys and then trying to fix things afterwards. So, you know, if you can start stepping in that direction in any way, you're going to start to have influence. Great. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. Cool. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye.